Hey everyone, we have a jam-packed show today, five big stories. Let's just jump right into it. And the first one deals with a new Intellivision system releasing in 2020 on October 10th to be exact. Yes, we know an exact release date for something that's still a couple years away. Why are we talking about this though? What does this have to do with Nintendo? Well, it turns out a bunch of former Nintendo employees are actually working on this here. Let me run down the list. Involved is Perrin Kaplan, a former vice president of marketing and corporate communications, who worked at Nintendo from 1992 through 2009 at Nintendo of America and oversaw all of the console launches during that time period. Next up, we have Beth Lilwillen, worked at Nintendo for 12 years as a PR representative. And then we also have Scott Tsumara, who also worked with the Nintendo software technology branch. Now the system itself uses wireless rechargeable controllers with motion sensing and a screen. It plays reborn versions of classic Atari and Intellivision games like Toe Jam and Earl. Uh, the system will also have 20 brand new games at launch and all games are priced between $299 and $799 and they will have zero microtransactions or loot boxes of any kind or paid DLC. The system will launch for $149 to potentially $179, as I said previously, on October 10th, 2020. Now, I find this all to be extremely interesting because a lot of former Nintendo uh, personalities are involved with the process on this. There's also a lot of other industry veterans working on this, and I'm not sure what to make of this. Is this a new system in the console game player space, or is this just a novelty system, sort of a classic system that remasters everything and then on top of remastering all those games, has a plan to consistently release new games. Is this Ouya, but with a direction? I don't know, but I think it's highly interesting that we have more co comp competitors in the space doing something different. This is definitely different. This is definitely gonna be uh, for those people who are retro fans of Atari or Intellivision, and I can't wait to see uh, what comes of it. I, it's gonna be a couple years before we see this device. I highly doubt we're gonna see it at an event like E3 or something, because it's just really expensive to be at one of those events. But I, I'm really cool like to see some of these old games like Toe Jam and Earl kind of remastered in a way for a new generation. Uh, I like the price point. <laughs> Obviously, everyone's gonna like the stance of no money transactions, no loot boxes, no DLC. Uh, people are going to like that kind of stuff, but uh, it, it seems like they're, you know, with the price ranges they're targeting, we're not looking at any major substantial AAA new games coming to the platform. Probably just games that fit within that kind of library of content. Again, it feels like a system that's going to be really, really cool for retro gamers that want these experiences in a newer way. And uh, I could see this fitting right under uh, several people's console collections as just like this really neat system that's just doing its own thing. And we'll see if there's a big enough market for such a system to exist. Next, we now know that Dynasty Warriors 8 Extreme Legends Definitive Edition is releasing on Nintendo Switch. Man, that was a mouthful. Uh, it was announced for Japan before, but now it's gonna be coming worldwide. And I think what's interesting here is that it's actually like a definitive edition uh, remastering of sorts of a, the original 2014 title, which in that of itself was kind of sort of a remastering and redoing of the original Dynasty Warriors 8. So it's just kind of redoing the same game over and over and over again, adding more stuff along the way. Uh, the game will be launching for $39.99. It'll be digital only. However, if you do purchase it in the first week it's out, there is going to be a 10% discount on the Nintendo Switch eShop. And you'll be able to do that the week of December 27th, so right towards the end of this year. Pretty exciting stuff. I think it's a very interesting uh, game in that of itself. I'm not a big Dynasty Warriors fan. But, I mean, this is one of the ones that's more highly touted. Maybe that's why it's coming out for its third edition. So, hey, it's more games on Switch. And if you've been dying for some more Dynasty Warriors love on the platform, well, here you go. So it's very apparent at this point that Starlink Battle for Atlas is essentially only really selling on Nintendo Switch. Now, we don't have figures exact for Japan and, and system breakdowns, and we don't have figures here in the United States either yet. And it's going to be a while before we know how it performed in those areas. But in the UK... It debuted at number 14 on the physical sales list, which actually is not that great of a debut for a brand new IP, but it is what it is. I, I think what's interesting about that number 14 spot is 82% of those physical Starlink sales were on Nintendo Switch. 
This lets you know the Switch version is clearly the most popular version. You have to wonder if maybe they should have made this a Switch exclusive. Maybe Nintendo themselves would have promoted it more. Obviously, the Switch version has the best deal in terms of content because you also get Fox, McCloud, and you get all the, all those side characters from the Star Fox series included, plus uh, some side missions and a side story related to the, that crew. So it's the best version of the game in terms of pure content, even if the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One versions naturally look prettier. So I, I feel like... Uh, this is something that if there is another Starlink game, if there's a follow-up, a sequel to this, it's probably going to end up being exclusively on Nintendo platforms at this point. When you have such, like when you see 82% of an audience for a game is literally on the one platform, at this point, you really should just focus in on that one platform moving forward. Again, we'll see if it gets popular enough to even get a sequel. Uh, we don't have exact numbers right now, uh, and I'm very curious to see how it performed here in the United States and North America when the MPD numbers land in a month. But still, um, again, Star Fox. People are treating it as a Star Fox game, hence all the sales are on Switch. In fact, I almost am wondering, what would Starlink have done if Star Fox wasn't included? Uh, I still would have bought it, but I don't know how many others would have. And, uh, I mean, I guess thank you Ubisoft and Nintendo for wanting to make this happen because if you didn't, a lot of people would have missed out on what I feel is a really high quality new IP. So apparently Dreamcast games might be coming to Nintendo Switch. Sega's Naoki Hori has uh, spoken in an interview with Famitsu at length about Dreamcast games on Switch. And essentially, it comes down to the fact that they are very, very close to being able to emulate Dreamcast games on Switch. So throw an emulator on Switch, get Dreamcast games to run smoothly. That is something they are almost done making a reality. Uh, they also have discovered that they still have most of the source code for many of the Dreamcast games. This makes it possible to actually directly port Dreamcast games to Switch and not need an emulator at all. So that is a possibility as well. And in a case like that, that's usually when you see something like the Arcade Archives, where it becomes an eShop release. And on the eShop, it would just be like a standalone game that runs natively on your Switch. I think that's a very interesting thing that could happen for a lot of you know Dreamcast fans out there. I'm sure Dreamcast guy is, is over there uh, wetting his whistle and getting all excited about this. Um, in addition, he went on to say how they don't technically have any plans in place to release Dreamcast games on Switch, whether through emulation or through standalone. And there have been talk about some certain Dreamcast games being added to Sega Ages. However, they did say that it was highly unlikely that would be the case. And with nothing set in stone, we don't really know the direction that these games are going to be taking moving forward. But what is very clear is that if they are close to at least getting them emulated, there is a high chance that Dreamcast games are going to be on Switch sometime in the next year in some form, at least certain Dreamcast games, especially the ones that Sega has all of the controlling interest in. I would obviously like to see a lot of them come over as well. Crazy Taxi and, oh man, I, I will never forget Skies of Arcadia. Yes, it came to GameCube, but guess what games are currently not coming to Switch? GameCube games. And I think this is actually a very interesting use case where Sega can get all their Dreamcast stuff to run on Switch, but we can't find a way to get GameCube games on Switch. And I know Nintendo has never said Switch can't do it. They just show a lack of interest in making that happen. So uh, again, Sega, Dreamcast, let's get those games all over. If I had to play the Dreamcast version of Skies of Arcadia on Switch, I guess that's what I'm going to play because I got really close to beating it back on the GameCube, but never quite finished it off as I was moving into college and stuff. So yeah, let's just see what happens. But I'm really glad that Dreamcast games, yes, Dreamcast games, I can't believe I'm even saying that, are going to be probably coming to Switch rather soon. Exciting stuff. Finally, Nintendo has done something I thought they should have done from the beginning of the launch of Labo, and that is that they have partnered with the Institute of Play to get Nintendo Labo into elementary schools across the United States. Obviously, with the idea of, of building up the skill sets required uh, to, to build these projects, to learn the physics behind them and the engineering and all that stuff, it's a great learning tool for kids. And I always felt Nintendo Labo's best market, and you can go back and check my receipts in the videos, was the education sector. And the fact that they were targeting families versus the education sector with an option for families to buy the stuff to use at home, I always felt was the biggest mistake of Labo because... Yes, I own the Nintendo Labo Variety Kit, and yes, I think it's really, really neat, and I think it's best 
purpose would be for education, educational reasons inside schools. So I'm glad to see that that's actually becoming a thing now and that Nintendo has shifted their focus from selling to families to try to partner and make it an education tool. I think that is the path forward. Obviously, in a partnership with this, Nintendo is usually, you know, not, not making money off of these deals, but this kind of deal and making it an important part of the education sector will lead to future partnerships between Nintendo and the education system to provide these units in a way where Nintendo does get a little bit of kickback, and it's a great way for Nintendo to diversify how they are providing products to the public. Again, Nintendo Labo is actually really, really fantastic. It's just not something that a lot of consumers are going to care about, especially at the price points at which you have to jump to get into. You know, you're talking, you know, 80, you know, $75 and, and up. It's just a lot of people aren't willing to make that jump. And if you're willing to partner this with education, I think you actually have a higher chance of getting some parents to walk into a Walmart and pick up a kit to use at home when their kids are raving about this Nintendo Labo stuff they do with their friends at school. When you can make that school connection at home, I think that's ultimately a positive thing. I mean, a lot of educational tools and toys that are at schools have found their way into people's homes because the kids love it so much in the school system. So kudos to Nintendo. I don't think it's too little too late. I just think this should have been the plan from the get-go. But hey, better late than never. Um, I can't wait. You know, I, I have kids in elementary school right now with a third one entering elementary school next year. I can't wait for them to potentially experience Labo in a school setting. They'd be like, hey, my dad's got that at home too. Like, this is really cool. I want to show dad how I can build remote control cars and uh, build a piano. And now I really want to play piano because I can make it myself. And like, I think it's, I think it's going to be a really, a really positive benefit in my house, assuming that my local school system will be involved in this program in some way. The Institute of Play has done some stuff with my local schools in the past. So I'm hoping that this becomes another, a, another addition to our education system locally here. Uh, if not in time for my kids to enjoy it, hopefully for future generations of kids to potentially get their hands on a switch on Nintendo and on Labo. Um, I also think it's going to help bring more people up into the Switch family as well from the younger generation. Anyways, folks, I'm Nathaniel Robodance from Nintendo Prime, and if you like this video, hit that like button. If you hate the video, I guess hit the dislike button. Uh, subscribe for more content. And remember, folks, we are giving away a Nintendo Switch Super Smash Bros. Ultimate Bundle. There's a Gleam.io link down in the description to enter. It is completely free, so you might as well check it out. The only requirement, I guess, if you want to call it that, is that you are subscribed to our channel. Pretty simple, pretty basic. Uh, I think a lot of you guys watching probably already are subscribed and probably already have entered, but we have new viewers every time. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch all of you guys in the next one. Yes.